name to that, to what she thought she was, what she thought she might be, what she thought she might become, or did you, because in my mind, it was open as to where she was headed. And I'm wondering if you had something specific in mind. Well, we originally were thinking of this as a pilot for a possible series. So we kind of wanted to leave it open at the end, uh, like what happens when she leaves the room? You know, she's very insular. She's in this room. She has this identity crisis. She has her wedding dress on the wall. She has her calendar marked. And um, it's really, I don't know, should I say what it is or you know, that's, yes. that's always been, you know, it's a, it's a tough issue. So she's dealing with her gender identity mm -hmm. and she's a young Hispanic woman, um, which we chose very purposefully and uh, from a very good family. And this news of her identity that she really feels inside that she's a man. Um, we didn't want somebody who looked butchy or, you know, man-like to begin with. We wanted somebody very feminine because there's all kinds of gender stories that run the gamut, you know? And we wanted somebody that the audience wouldn't go, oh, who is that? You know, we wanted somebody that, that could uh, attract and get their attention and involvement uh, for upfront um, and then do the reveal so that people had empathy for her and understanding of her, mm -hmm. her identity and she um, talks to an unseen male in the room. Um, some people think, oh, she's talking to God. She's, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, she's talking to an old lover who snuck in the room somehow. Um, so it, it's, it's a really cool film to show to an audience and be there in the audience. So this virtual thing, I mean, it's wonderful because we can all be connected and, and see films we wouldn't normally see, but it's really wonderful to be in an audience with people where you hear audible gasps and then you hear kind of ahas, you know, aha moment. We were very fortunate to get a wonderful song by Diane Warren. Um, to go in the end of the film. And uh, Wendy and I had been sort of courting her for years to do something with her. And she finally like loved the movie and wanted to, you know, give us this song. So yes. we're very happy yeah. with that and how it worked, so. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Any questions from the group? For I mean, Wendy, did you wanna join, did you wanna comment on, on any of that since you wrote it? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I feel is that it really is for everyone. We all have secrets, all of us, that we mm -hmm. don't share with anyone. Uh, hers was much bigger than probably many of us. But um, and it's also came out of the fact that I talk to the mirror sometimes. I don't know what everybody does. They talk in their head. But sometimes in the morning, you know, you're looking at yourself and, you know, you you have a moment where you're talking and, you know, not, uh, and, and you're trying to work out something because you don't know how to really um, figure it out on your own. And I think that's what I wanted to do was um, make it very identifiable. And like Vicki said, it was really important that people don't judge her because a lot of LBGTQ, you know right away who they are. Mm -hmm. And so immediately you have a judgment about the person. Even though we don't want to, we're not prejudiced and all these things, but we just put people in boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that we wanted to achieve was for nobody to know so that they would take the ride without judgment. And so that's why there's a lot of gasps at the end because no, very few people figure out that when she looks in the mirror, she's talking to herself as a man. And so that was what we wanted to achieve in the film. And so hopefully people will still feel like they're connected to this person, even if they don't believe in the lifestyle. Um, so that was, that was you know, what my goal was mm -hmm. in, in, in writing the film. Well, I, I think you achieved that goal. Oh, good. That's good. Spectacular, I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, shall we bounce over to Robin? Robin Paris, who made Fruitless. Yes. <clears throat> so the, the inspiration behind it? Was that the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so Fruitless is a dark comedy 
um, about a 40 something woman who desperately wants to join the group of young moms that meets outside her window. Um, and so she goes to drastic lengths in order to do so. So she essentially tries to get pregnant by a couple guys, it doesn't really work out. <laughs> and um, for me, I wanted to explore sort of the dark side of motherhood. I think the decision to become a motherhood is, is it, it, a mother is a, is a kind of very tough decision for women. Um, it's, it's layered with lots of guilt. It's layer, I mean, being a mother is layered with guilt anyway, being, not being a mother is layered, layered with guilt. I think it's just a very complicated kind of decision for women to make, especially in the modern modern times where there's, I feel like for career women, women there's guilt placed on people who make, you know, career their focus is why aren't you a mother? And then if you are a mother and you put your career on hold, there's guilt placed on women for that. And I just kind of wanted to explore some of the nuances of those emotions um, in a woman who is over 40 and um, it, kind of facing the issues that you may face as you you know age and you may not be able to become a mother. Um, you may not ever be able to join this special group of mm -hmm. moms or motherhood as a, as a group. I wanted to explore the concept of motherhood as a club <laughs> that you mm -hmm. either are in or you're out. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I, I did that and I tried to make it funny as well. It also has dark moments. <laughs> Um, it gets pretty dark near the end. Um, and I've done a lot of broad comedy in the past. I wanted to do something really grounded with this one. So. So, so yes, and I certainly think you achieved that. Um, I, was, I, I was wondering as I watched it, I actually watched it two or three times, um, but if she longed to have a baby because she wanted to, wanted to join that group of mothers she saw on the street? Um, and was her motivation because she um, wanted to be younger than her 40 years? I feel like, yes, that's definitely uh, an element. Um, you know, all the women outside who she sees outside her window are all younger. Mm -hmm. um, and they all have babies or young kids. I have two kids myself and for me, as um, my kids are 15 and 12, so they're older now, but when I do see young groups of mothers, there is that pang of a little bit of jealousy, even though I've been there, it's kind of like, well, it's a club and a time that I'll never have back. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of a special like new time when everything's just a discovery. And I sort of wanted to explore that, that, that longing. Um, and I also wanted to add the complexity of feeling bad for longing for, for longing for that um, and feeling bad that, you know, that that's not what, I mean, I, I have a career, I want to be a career woman, but that's not what I'm supposed to value. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wanted to explore some of the layers there, but yeah, I definitely think the aging and the younger women has, is yeah. definitely a part of this. Yeah. Yeah. And then at the end, I, I thought, well, maybe she's frustrated because she, she um, can't get pregnant and never could get pregnant. And, and so that whole thing was uh, another kind of theme in my head. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, this character has a lot of issues. Um, I, I feel like she's over time had a lot of problems, things that have happened and gone wrong for her. And she probably has wanted to be a mother in the past and not been able to be one. And, and I also set up that she's kind of lost her group of friends recently and that no one really wants to hang out with her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she sees this group of moms having fun and she's like, maybe I can join them. Maybe they'll be my friend. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. just sort of, she's a little bit desperate. And, and I just think it's kind of fun to explore that. I mean, I think I've felt like that before. I think we all have, but, um, and so I, I just, I wanted to have a little fun with, with that, but also put in some depth mm -hmm. um, with that character. Right. It's not a laughable, I mean, there's things to laugh at, but it's not a laughable yeah. character. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Um, Carolyn? Good yeah, hi. <laughs> hi, I loved that movie. I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. So <laughs> how did that start? How on earth did you get to decide on the antagonist that you did? 
Sorry, say well, I didn't quite catch the question. How did you decide on that particular antagonist in the movie? Um, what how how I came up with the whole concept, you mean? Yes, yes. Um, it was actually a friend had been given the title of Homewreckers by her therapist. And as as my friend's uh, friend is an actress, her therapist wanted her to kind of write something and just kind of get it out of her. And but because it's quite close to home, the sort of traditional, you know, word of home records in terms of a, you know, a marriage or someone breaking up a relationship, she felt it was too close and too emotional for her to write something. So I kind of always like to think outside the box. And so I kind of gave her suggestions of how I might go about it kind of thing and, and sort of look at a home wrecker as not, not a human, but it could be a, an animal, it could be a cat, it could be a dog. And it was, um, yeah, it was a hot summer, strangely in UK, and there were a lot of flies. So I kind of thought, oh yeah, I, I would probably use a fly kind of thing and how it could just devastate this, this whole kind of set up at home. So my friend didn't actually end up writing something. So there was a competition in, well, it's worldwide. It's called IMDb Script to Screen. So the International Movie Database. Um, the guy who founded that is called Cole Needman. He's in the UK and there's a competition where um, writers um, are given the challenge of writing a 10 minute script of any genre, any title and, and enter into this competition. So it started as a script. And then I was lucky enough to win the script competition and get some funding, um, a little bit of funding to make and produce the film, which had to be made within four months. And then it was screened um, at a festival in, in the UK um, who sort of helped fund it. Yeah. Um, so the fly was the um, um, kind of the star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's kind of a romantic meal at home. A couple, Lee and Jen, have been together in a sort of you know a relationship for many years, but they're not married. And um, Lee, her her boyfriend, wants to kind of propose to her that night. So it's all very romantic at home, and candles and soft music. And then he gets a little bit stressed, and he opens a window. It's you know it's summer, and then in comes a fly, which kind of causes a lot of devastation <laughs> things get smashed there's arguments you know they break up and it, it's kind of I wanted to do um something romantic but something which was real life because life throws curveballs so you might think oh yeah I want it to be like this really romantic how I'm proposed to but then life happens doesn't it and it can just go completely mm -hmm. pear shape mm -hmm. not how you intended it but it's kind of that that beauty of the messiness of a relationship. It's not mm -hmm. Disney, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of ugliness sometimes, a lot of beauty, it's messy. And um, so I wanted that messiness, but a happy ending at the end. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> well, that was a, that was a, a, a great job. Um, and just so, um, so easy to watch. It was just fun, just. Oh. That's great. <laughs> so, I, I, did you, I, I, did you use a, a CGI fly? Um, you, uh, well, that's fly yeah. well. We did have a um, I had a friend who put in um, a CGI one, but we also did actually have um, a real one as well. Um, there's a type of fly. Gosh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a type of fly which is smaller than the house fly, but it doesn't actually fly. So I had to buy a load of these flies and hatch them <laughs> kind of thing because we wanted we wanted to actually have a close up of a fly kind of thing. So um, the great thing with this fly is that it doesn't fly. It's got some kind of genetic flaw. Um, so that enabled us to kind of have some close ups. So we did have a real one, but we also did have a CGI one, which is, was put in as well, yeah. But um, some of it's just kind of acting, you know, imagining the fly there. So yeah, it was quite a challenge, <laughs> yeah. And we had a cat, so it was like, oh gosh, cat and flies, and yeah, it was quite intense. <laughs> how, how long is it? Um, gosh, I think it's just about 11, 12 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. 1125 I have yeah 1125 yeah. yeah yeah good okay Deckel your turn unmute yeah. okay and um 
um, hold on just a minute. I lost my place here. Um, Deckel, you, your film was Anna, story mm -hmm. of uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian woman, yes? Mm -hmm. um, what Ukrainian uh, women um, can do socially. And, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's so a, tell us about that. I will tell you about the film. First of all, the film is the second part of a series of films that I was, that I am working oh. on actually. And the first film is called Ashmina and it's, uh, I shot it in Nepal and Anna is the second part. And I actually, I didn't go to film school. Uh, I went to, to film school for three months and I dropped out. Um, and I thought I will just take the tuition fees and I will go and I will shoot my own short on my own. And then I thought if I'm already, if I'm going to do that, um, it just makes more sense to make a few short films and, and be able to put them together. So to create a theme that runs through them or a few themes um, anyway, so I came up with this project to go around the world and shoot five short films about five different uh, women or girls of different <laughs> ages and different backgrounds and with completely different stories of women or, who are marginalized, um, 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 minorities or um, about um, child children rights and um, Anyway, there's all kinds of, of themes that go through the films and each film is, is different, but if you would watch all of them, then you could you could see all the, the connecting points. And um, so, yeah, so so Anna is the second film and it tells the story of a middle-aged woman who um, has a um, teenage daughter and she lives in Ukraine, in East Ukraine, close to where the war with Russia is. Um, so it's, it's kind of like very poor and quite miserable. And then she hears the radio advertisements that invites the women of the town to come to a mixer where American men come to come into town to uh, meet the local women and take them, maybe one of them back with them to the States. And it's actually based on these real parties that happen in Ukraine and in all of East Europe since uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, really since the nineties. And it's something that still goes on. And of course, uh, it talks about, you know, so, the, so these women are in Ukraine, it's a, it's a very poor country and the American men are coming, they're looking for, you know, somebody they can take. So it's like they're build, banking on their like them being desperate and wanting to leave the country. And anyway, so that's what the story is about. And um, yeah, I don't want to ruin the surprise in the end. And, uh, right, okay. right. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about the whole movie. Is it, are you putting the five indi individual pieces together into one whole film? So first of all, when I started making film, it was quite obvious for me that um, I will get rejected from film festivals, from big film festivals, and I will have to make a lot of films. Um, and then to put it together and then re get rejected as a feature, but then, um, Miraculously, my film started getting into festivals and Anna screened in Cannes mm -hmm. in Toronto. So um, I kind of like got to the end of the road when it comes to short films. So I just decided to take the third part and expand it into a feature. So that's what, what I'm working on now. Okay. Um, but I'm definitely planning in the future to finish this project because um, I already wrote the scripts and I absolutely I'm sure all of you know, once you write a script that you really like, um, you know that you have to shoot it <laughs> no matter what. So I have these, these other three parts um, in mind and uh, I plan over the next few years to finish them. Very good. Well, wish, you a, uh, wish you a lot of luck with that, with finishing up. And, and we have um, uh, about 15 minutes uh, left and I like to kind of open it up to uh, everybody here um, to ask whatever. Is Shireen, I'm sorry, is Shireen and here? Can she talk, uh, is she gonna talk about her film? Sure. Shireen? She's, I think she's the head of the festival, isn't she? She is, yes. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't Yes. Know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Shireen is listening, we think. And Shireen, if you wanna jump in, feel free. Maybe. Um, 
What questions do you have of the fellow, uh, your fellow filmmakers here? Any questions? I, I would want to know like where, where you guys all get your funding from, because that always seems like the uh, bane of our existence as filmmakers mm -hmm. and short filmmakers. And uh, I've discovered in the last, I don't know what, five years or so that it costs uh, probably about 12 to $1,500 per screen minute to do even a yes. simple film, like a woman up in a, in a bedroom, you know, um, Wendy's in my last film called You Drive Me Crazy was a dark comedy. We like to call it a comedy with consequences. And it was shot with like green screen and, and cars and miniatures and slow-mo and, and, but it was still in about in that range, even with visual effects. So um, yeah, I'm just curious, like where, what's the best place that you've found to, you know, get your funding? Like Jekyll, like, where do you get, you know, do you have people who support you? You know, I mean, I not support always, you, like pay for everything, but. I, I always say as a joke that it's my, my bar mitzvah money. But, <laughs> but my bar mitzvah money went no. on my, but my bar mitzvah money went on my first car. <laughs> but I'm uh, 41 and uh, I'm an adult who, you know, I have, I have another work. I actually, I have like filmmaking is my full-time job, but I actually have a completely other full-time job where I'm, um, web designer and the coder and I've been doing that for years and literally when I was shooting my films I was on set and yelling and screaming and working and then going back to my room at say, one o'clock in the night and then answering emails and answering customers so really it's really crazy but that's my story but now the feature um, obviously feature is completely different and um, you have, well also I'm from Europe um, so it's different in Europe you go and you start to apply for public funding and then you create a, a co-production, you go to other countries and you ask money there. And of course, you can mix it with private um, private money. So, yeah. Um, for me, I've always kind of written and produced so I can act in things and I've always just done it out of my own pocket, but meaning on a shoestring on like literally hardly any budget. Um, so yeah, lots of favors. I'm lucky that I know a lot of actors, so I can always sort of entice them in, if it's a, if it's a well-written short. But um, this was the first one I'd ever got any funding on. So for Home Wreckers, I got five thousand pounds to make it. Um, I'm not sure what that would be in U.S. dollars. Maybe about six thousand dollars. Um, we shot over three and a half days. Everyone was paid apart from me, <laughs> the producer and the writer. And obviously producing it, I did like everything. So it was finding locations. It was getting costumes, getting props. It was sorting out catering. Yeah, just everything. So in order to pay everybody else, yeah. It was, but it was a very little amount for everybody. Everyone sort of took a massive reduction, but it was, you know, hey, we're getting paid for, for everybody else. And um, the only people that didn't get paid was... Um, yeah, the music I got, I had a friend who, who's in a great band. Um, so it's just always asking a lot of favors, advertising on different kind of websites because people do want to get experience. Um, so, um, but if not, it's um, competitions. Sometimes I've um, made a short film for a competition where there's a, a financial prize. So then I've been able to sort of, you know, when I've been lucky, get the money back that I did sort of spend. But out of my own pockets, it's never been more than a thousand pounds. But for me, it's kind of worth it because I just want to make stuff. So I know you can spend so much time sort of applying for things, you know, weeks of doing forms and then the hope and it's also competitive. So for me, I just want to sort of make it kind of thing and then kind of, yeah, put it on the credit card and just go to charity shop you know just try and get it as cheaply as possible so some things you have to kind of spend money on I've discovered like sound you know that's always a, a you've just got to kind of thing <laughs> that's mm -hmm. a must but um yeah it's amazing how many people will offer themselves up for free you know because and people love to do stuff together you know it's you know you could just you know be sat at home doing nothing but or you could be making a short film and meeting people so there's lots of benefits of collaborating but it does get tricky after a lot of years when you've been pulling in the favors and you're like oh my gosh can I really ask these people again for something so it's getting to that point and it's like yeah I need to move up to the next level and, and have 
money and really sort of up my game kind of thing but there's also crowdfunding a lot of people you know raise money that way um yeah but it's surprising what you can do on on not that much money sometimes having money can complicate things kind of thing it can make it more stressful sometimes and and if you've got people on set and everyone's sort of giving their time for free you know that you've got people who really want to make a film so you often have great attitude and it's also just good to get people that you know together and it's just a really fun exp experience kind of thing but yeah money is yeah tricky and well I, I wonder if you know because in LA there's just so much filmmaking and everybody's like using up everybody's favors all the time so you know it's um I've just found it's hard it's hard to you know do everything but what have you have you guys found uh, Robin sorry I'll let you you answer that too but have you found like to make things in the time of covid now is uh, dampening our our styles our our plans about, all that stuff i'm about to try to make something in november um and it's just adding expense i mean covid adds quite a bit of expense with testing the actors um and all the ppe the the face shields and the things you have to, the hoops you have to jump through, plus hiring a COVID compliance officer to be on set, um, wow. you know, and people have to be certified in order to be on set um, for that. I've heard, so, I've heard some people will uh, just, you know, cause the COVID compliance uh, testing or whatever is like 50 bucks. And so they just get somebody from the set to take the testing and then they don't have to pay like a ma you know, major bucks for the officer, but. Just yeah, thought. yeah, that, that's a strategy. That's a strategy. Our producer is actually COVID certified, but she thinks it's a conflict of interest to be our also be our officer. Um, but yeah, to answer your previous question, I've crowdfunded a lot of my projects. I've done Kickstarter back when it was, you know, it was like 2015 is when I first did Kickstarter and I've raised quite a bit of money. But the thing that I've also done through Kickstarter is that I've raised a fan base. Um, so if you get people who like your work and have supported you in the past, a lot of times you can turn to them later for future projects um, that, and you don't go through crowdfunding, you just say, hey, I'm doing something else. Do you wanna be an investor or do you wanna help fund? And I've had people who I met through crowdfunding you know, fund future projects of mine. So, and, and, and I don't think that would have happened had I not done crowdfunding. Also then when I did finally release my projects, this was, I did a, a web series that was pretty popular. And when I released that, I had a lot of eyeballs, people who wanted to see it because who already knew it existed because of crowdfunding. So I found that, but you know, people are more exhausted with crowdfunding now. Um, they're tired of, you know, funding things for everybody's been asked like a zillion times to donate. So people are a little getting a little wary of it now. It was different five years ago. Um, but, you know, I still will say there's Steed and Spark. That's another, you know, filmmaking crowdfunding platform. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I've even I found like Facebook hard. is really good too. I mean, cause it's so easy, you know, people just click and donate. So we, we had a pretty successful run for that for um, reflections. I think we raised how much, uh, like 2000 or something. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. 3,500, I think, altogether. Yeah, so, yeah. And you did Speed, uh, Seed and Spark for your first. Oh, I did Speed, Speed and Spark for um, another short film that I did that was like 35 minutes. But again, it's like $35,000, but that was a six day shoot, you know, a 30 minute film. Um, Reflections is eight minutes. So it's still yeah. coming out about that $1,000, $1,200 per screen minute for costs. Mm -hmm you know, including like posters and because I'm a sound editor. So I kind of, I, and a film editor. So I do like the film editing and the sound editing myself. And, you know, I can do a lot of things myself. So I don't even count that as, as money as, as most of us who multitask, <laughs> we don't, you know, so. Hi, Shireen, you're there. Hi, Shireen. Hi, Shireen. As far Hi. as COVID goes, Hi. Um, you yeah. know, Vicki and I are going to do a short with her family. Uh, so, um, sometimes that, you know, if you have a handy group of people that hang out together, um, I think that's a good way to think about it. What can you do with the people who are hanging out as long as they're somewhat, you know, uh, talented in, in what you need them to do. So that's what we're going to do. 
but yeah, it's, I just been, gotta judge. it's, it's gotta... been challenging. I mean, you know, be, for especially for a short film to do all the COVID things, um, how do you, how do you, uh, and I'm doing, a, Vicky and I are doing a class at Cal State um, for screenwriting, she's for sound. And um, it, it's really challenging the kids because they have a project that they have to do for their masters. And um, we're trying, you know, and I said, look, you know, as a producer, you have to think outside the box because if it can go wrong, it will go wrong on the set. So I, I said to them, this is a great exercise in learning how to think on your feet and you actually have time to think. So uh, they've been coming up with very interesting ideas on how to deal with not having two actors in a room and yet having them in, you know, play with each other and, uh, you know, tricks of camera and, you know, Zoom and, and all these things. So it's been an interesting time for students, film students particularly, to try to figure out how to navigate something they never thought they'd have to deal with as a filmmaker. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting time. I mean, I've, I just um, I just got a job, uh, my first directing job, uh, and it's all gonna be via Zoom um, for this series, a web series about um, like online dating during the pandemic. <laughs> so I don't even have to be on set. I, I'm directing it over Zoom. So, and people are becoming very creative in how they're, I'm doing a sound project for a friend who's doing a sock puppet show. And we recorded all the voices of the actors from their individual homes over Zoom, but then they recorded it you know, well in their own homes. And then they sent me all the files and I'm compiling all these files and we're creating, you know, a timeline of, of the actors so that the puppets can, you know, do that on a set safely. So the actors aren't talking at all. So people are coming up with very creative ideas for this time period. So we'll see. <laughs> Shireen, would you like to jump in here? You have something to say to these folks? I'm sure you do. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say hello. I've been listening the whole time, but I was also running around making breakfast, uh, <laughs> doing emails, social media. <laughs> but, um, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, participating this morning mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, panel. And thank you for submitting your films um, to our festival. They're all wonderful films and um, we're so honored to have them this year at our festival. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And you've had in-person screenings too, right? Is that true? Yeah. Or, yeah? Yes, we have. I'm, the movie theaters are, uh, we had uh, two screenings last night at two different venues and the venues are, um, well in Connecticut they're in phase three, but they're working in like a phase two scenario. So really a lot less seating. Um, so socially distanced seating, wearing masks, they're sanitizing everything. Um, I think everyone felt really safe and comfortable. Um, and we had all ages there um, at these screenings. So, you know, so far so good. Um, you know, we have three more days to go. So we just have to be really vigilant and not let our guard down. It's um, you know, naturally, when you start to get together with people, even if you're wearing masks, you're like, oh, how are you? Haven't seen you in a while. Or so nice to meet you. We've only met via Zoom. And like, you naturally just want to get closer to people. So we have to kind of like, all right, everyone, <laughs> stand back, <laughs> be careful. We all need those like dog collars around us, right? <laughs> <laughs> you take your dog to the vet and do that. <laughs> yeah. But I, it's been so nice just to like be with other people and um, you know see see a movie on a big screen. That was also very cool. So yeah, yeah. Um, I just had a question about how can we see each other's films? Because I I don't know. There's like so many links and things. Do we need to buy a ticket? Do we? How do we see each other's films? So I, I believe all of your films are in one block of films on the Seed and Spark uh, platform. And it's, they're all in the narrative films, uh, short films two, number two. Um, so 
So that's probably the, be the best and easiest way to watch everyone's films from this group. And I can send you links and everything um, by email to help you connect or navigate all of that. But everyone's film page has a, if you scroll down, it shows where, where the film is screening, whether it's live or, or part of the uh, online festival. And then there's a link. So I'm wondering of Carolyn and Robin, because Deckel already said his, like what got, what do you have coming up for yourselves as far as films go? Um, I'm in another competition, which is called Enter the Pitch. Um, it's my 10th year of entering this particular competition. The reason I keep entering it is because the prize is 30,000 pounds to make a short film and also get to go to LA. So um, you have to pitch the idea and do a two minute video pitch as well as the written information. But all the films have to be um, inspired by the Bible. Um, so this year, if you know the Bible story of Moses in the basket, um, I've done a very contemporary um, quirky comedy of, of Moses in the basket. Yeah. So I just found out this week that I'm in the sort of the beginning of the competition. I've got to the first round. So that's 60 pitches. And then in a couple of weeks, they reduce it to 20. So yeah, that's what I've been sort of working on. So we'll see how, how that goes this year. Yeah. Yeah. How about Robin? Um, yeah, so I have two things coming up in November. I'm doing two more episodes of my web series, which is called The Room Actors, Where Are They Now? It's a comedy about what happened to the actors who were in the cult film, The Room, after they were in, quote, the Citizen Kane of bad movies. Um, and so it has the real actors from the cult film, The Room. We're doing two more episodes. Um, and then in um, January, I'm doing something called Public Nuisance. It's a period piece set in 1820s, early America about women, bad women in the 1800s, women who are doing things like trying to learn to read and um, speaking back to their husbands and not always cooking all the time. <laughs> so horrible things like that. So it's a comedy and it's just exploring kind of this, the, the plight of women in the 1800s. And it hopefully has some parallels to some of the, you know, plights and experiences we are having even today as women. So. Uh, uh, any other comments? We were supposed to um, uh, go until quarter of, and it's all almost 10 minutes of uh, 12 now. And I didn't know if Kevin was just going to shut us off or not. But <laughs> oh, I just wanted one more thing about yeah. uh, virtual film festivals. How, how have you found your experience with virtual film festivals so far? Because our film you know, premiered in Sedona this year in February and it end the festival ended on the 28th of February where, where everything was just sort of coming, you know, and, and we were all at buffets and hugging, kissing, you know, big theaters full of people. And then we get back and it's like, oh my gosh, but nobody got sick, thank God. But after that, it was like no more, no more in-person anything. So, except for you guys, that's really great. <laughs> But I, I found that they're very good, you know, except for what I mentioned before about how, uh, you know, you want, as a filmmaker, you want to see people's reactions to your movie and experience them seeing your film for the first time. And, and that's the thing that I miss the most, besides like networking and seeing people and stuff like that, especially for this film, because it really, you know, wants and needs like a reaction, to, you know, that's satisfying to me as the filmmaker to just hear people and, and discuss it afterwards with the audience, you know, and yeah. which is a hard movie to discuss if you haven't seen it. That's why I was like, eh, should I say it or not say it to you guys? But we did, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm hearing from other filmmakers that they really miss that audience experience, um, uh, in-person audience experience. So, um, but I think everyone's also really grateful that this platform, the online platform exists and that, you know, we don't have to completely shut down. This is a way to, you know, get, get our work out there and, and still um, get feedback and communicate with people. So, you know, thank goodness we have this. Um, 
And I'll, I'll be able to give you better feedback at the end of the festival because I've actually never done this before. So it's all a new experience for me too. Well, you're, you're doing a great job, you know, cause it is it's new waters for everybody. And, you know, I think it does give filmmakers, I mean, look at, we have somebody in Cyprus and England, you know, um, people from all over the world connect through film and it's just really a, a very satisfying uh, way to, to do this. So I mm -hmm. applaud you. <laughs> yeah, Michael, where are you in uh, Cyprus? I lived there for two years. Ah, I'm in Larnaca. In oh, Larnaca. okay. So I just have a very small, funny, not, not fun, so funny story to tell you. So I'm in Cyprus and Anna screened in something like 300 festivals, but I've been in only two or three physically. Okay. And uh, suddenly I got an email that the Cyprus Short Film Festival accepted the film. So I was so happy because I could go for a real screening, right? And uh, anyway, then I get an email from them that they are inviting me for five nights in a hotel, okay? Because it's in a different town, which is 40 minutes from here. So I went to have a vacation in this hotel in this town 40 minutes from here, and I got a stipend even. I got some... 200 euros. Anyway, the last day of the festival comes and it was a five day festival. And every day of the festival, they announced more and more, more and more people got uh, infected with COVID. Oh, yeah. More, 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 more. Friday comes of my screening and it spiked to like 200 around the country. It's a small country. So 200 is like a lot. Okay. It's like compared to the US, it's like tens of thousands. Okay. If you multiply it. Anyway, all my friends who were supposed to come to the screening said, we're sorry, we're not coming, okay? <laughs> I freaked out and I just, just decided I'm not going. Now, I, I was 300 meters from the theater and I just couldn't bring myself to go because it was a theater and it's people sitting close to each other. And I told myself, you know, it's awful but I'm not going and I just didn't and I felt awful and I wrote them an email. I want to give you back the money for the hotel and I want to give you back the money of the stipend and I apologized like a thousand times and they like, they were very cool about it and they told me, no, you don't have to give us back the money. It's fine, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so that's my story. Wow. <laughs> well, you got, to, you got to see beautiful Cyprus at least. Yeah, and to spend five, five days in the other town. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. Um, it was really great meeting you all in person, online, in person. Um, thank you, uh, Anita, for um, moderating. And Anita, you also have a film at the fe festival. Why don't you tell everyone about your film before? <laughs> yes. Um, I, uh, a few years back, I, you, you, you may, may be able to tell by the white hair that I'm a little bit older than you, you folks. So, but a bunch of uh, retired um, had um, gotten together and decided we wanted to make a movie. And none of us had ever made a movie before, except maybe a home movie. And um, so we just jumped in and we uh, started making short movies and we made uh, three of them. And uh, one of them is in, the last one is in the festival um this year and it's um about what happens when a syrian refugee moves in next door to a man who is suffering from ptsd and uh so anyway what's so, it called what's it called uh, uh second chance cafe it's funny uh, years ago i made a, a movie called last chance saloon so that's oh, really? <laughs> How wonderful for you, Benita. Yeah. That's fantastic. I applaud Thanks. you for doing that. Keeps our, our minds going, you know? <laughs> well, no, and it's a creative outlet. It's, it's yeah. fantastic. So yeah. you have a second career. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's probably more like my seventh career, but anyway. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, who's counting, right? Right. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Well, thank wonderful you. to meet you all. And so enjoy your films, and I look forward to seeing more. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Fascinating you stuff, so fascinating you. stories. Bye. It's great to meet everyone. Nice to meet you all. Thank Thank you. Yeah, lovely to meet you. Good luck to okay. all of you. Yes.
Bye. 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 You too. Stay safe. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.